So hello and welcome along to In Conservation with yet another episode of this series, an ongoing series of conversations with people within the world of cons conservation. I almost, almost said conversation there. In the world of conservation. Uh, my name is David Lindo, also known as the Urban Birder. And today um, I have with me for the third time, Mary Colwell. <laughs> And um, firstly, Mary, I just want to ask you, how are you? And before I even ask you where you are, I know that last time, because you've been on twice before, but last time, for the last two times, you were living above a bus station in Bristol. Is that still the case? <laughs> it's still the case, David. Still there, sitting above the buses, right in the middle of Bristol. And, and how are you, Mary? Yeah, I'm good. Thank you very much. I'm uh, yes, I'm fine. Thank you. I'm a little bit un overworked and underpaid, but uh, hands up anybody who doesn't feel that. So uh, apart from that, we're all OK. We're still smiling. And that's the main thing. That is the main thing. And it's interesting because um, you've been on twice before. I think the last time was probably about a year ago. Yeah. And during those times, we hadn't met but we have now, we've actually met. And may I tell you, ladies and gentlemen, in the Zoom room now, and also for anyone else, anyone else in the future watching this, Mary is one of the nicest people in conservation. I oh, absolutely David. She is a legend. I've said that to her before meeting her, and I'm actually more convinced now. Um, so I'm very happy that she has uh, agreed to come on today's um, In Conservation With. Um, before we start actually chatting, because today um, on this episode of In Conservation, we're going to be kind of having a conversation. Um, and although it's billed, in fact, it's billed as a, a woman on a mission. And in fact, that's what the conversation is about. It's about your pilgrimage. It's about all of our pilgrimages, really. Um, but just to explain who Mary is very quickly, um, she's an award winning author. She's a producer and campaigner for nature. She's an environmentalist. She won the Sony Radio Academy Gold Award and was awarded the British Trust for Ornithology's Dillis Breeze Medal and the David Bellamy Award for, from the Game Keepers Association and the WWT Marsh Award for Conservation and an RSPB Metals Medal. So you've got a really full cabinet of trophies there. Um, she spearheaded the sex successful establishment of the GCSC Natural History, which we'll be talking about today. And uh, you are the chair of the uh, Curly Recovery Partnership in England, another subject we'll be talking about today. And uh, you set up a ch charity which is called Curly Action in 2020. And uh, we, we will also kind of start off talking about your latest book, A Gathering Place, okay, which uh, has been out a little while now, not too long. The problem with these, these weird backgrounds is you can't see the books very clearly. Um, and I guess it's essentially about what you mentioned in the last time you were on in conservation, the fact that you have been on a pilgrimage, you've been on the Camino in Spain, that walk. A lot of people I know have been on that. So let's, let's ask the question, I mean, how long is it and what kind of strategy do you have to have to do that kind of walk? Is it like X amount of miles a day and you get your bag sent onto the hotel ahead of you or do you lump all that stuff with you? <laughs> um, it, the, the sort of full Camino, if you like, the, the traditional one is 500 miles and it starts on the French side of the Pyrenees, goes over the Pyrenees and then uh, right across the top of Spain, uh, ending up at Santiago de Compostela. So it takes this, uh, it's the oldest Christian pilgrimage in the world and um, basically it's it's based on very ancient trade routes so it takes the quickest route between villages so it's not necessarily a great wilderness route or anything like that it's very definitely a walk between places um, and how long you walk per day is up to you and how much you feel I walked maybe 20 to 25 kilometers a day um, I did have a bit of a break in the middle of it. And uh, it's it took me about five and a half to six weeks in total. And it's it's kind of 
what you make it, David. I mean, a pilgrimage can mean anything. It can be at the one extreme, it can be a very religious thing as it always was. The Camino was <clears throat> in its earliest days, it's been going for a thousand years. Very, very definitely a very religious thing to do. But today, I would say most people who walk the Camino don't do it for religious reasons. Not those, not that very strict definition anyway. It tends to be a time of to walk and reflect, to step out from the norm, to look inside yourself a bit, to have a bit of a reorientation, to try and make some decisions. So I would say it fits into a much broader category now, far broader than ever used to be. Um, but it's a very definite set route. It's way marked. It's, you know, everyone stays kind of in the same places. So that's that's what the Camino is. It's quite special because it's so old. <clears throat> the thing about it, though, what was different when I did it was normally it's it's it. So the Camino was incredibly popular in the Middle Ages and it fell out, almost disappeared due to war and plagues and changing fashions and so on. And it wasn't revived until the 20th century, right at the end of the 20th century. Uh, and then it started to increase. People got a bit more interested in it again. And then this film called The Way came out. And The Way was uh, got Martin Sheen in it. And it was quite a, it's quite a, it's a very moving film. And, um, and he, it was about him walking it uh, because of his son. Uh, and that sparked a massive revival. And so number of people walking it now is really huge. Third of a million. I think actually last year, 350,000 people walked it. So uh, not maybe not all the 500 miles, but certainly the last 100K, which is the kind of the, what you have to do to get, get your stamp. So um, it's a very, very popular pilgrimage. But the thing that I did is I walked it in between lockdowns. So as soon as the first lockdown was lifted, I packed a bag and went. And um, and that meant that I had the whole thing virtually to myself, which was quite an unusual thing to do. And you walked and, on your own, didn't you? I did. I walked on my own and I didn't have my bags carried. I did carry everything. And boy, would I have liked to have had my bags carried. But <laughs> that wasn't possible for all the sort of restrictions that were in place at the time. So I just put on a rucksack and off I went. In the beginning of the book, I remember reading about someone like some weird, not even weird, <clears throat> some mysterious guy <throat> leaving a stick behind, walking stick. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, he was so lovely. He was a farmer from Catalan and he'd walked it because he was a farmer. He couldn't get away for very long. So um, he did the whole Camino many times, but just in weeks at a time, one week here and one week there. And he always carried this enormous stick. It was just massive, about two metres or something. And he was no bigger than me. And I'm a half pint, as you know. So uh, I, when I first saw it, all I saw was the stick, because I don't know where he was, and thought, well, he must be a giant or something. Uh, and then when I met him, there was this very little man with a very tall stick. So it was all, it was, um, there's definitely characters along the way. Uh, but they were few and far between. And in the beginning, there were mute there were more by the time i finished which was in december there was nobody I, I had the whole thing to myself basically so it got less and less people as i went along it got more and more wintry it got more and more challenging for lots of reasons yeah quite an experience yeah well you can find out the reasons obviously reading your book but one thing i wanted to ask you was do you, do you did you feel alone did you feel lonely at times did you want to sort of go home that's interesting did i feel lonely did i feel alone those are two very different things aren't they uh yes i felt alone for sure and there were times when you just looked ahead and there was just empty roads as far as the eye could see and nobody on them <clears throat> and the next village was five miles away or something and it rained a lot and i remember one day sitting at a little bench by the side of the road in absolutely tipping rain and um, I was drenched through. I still had five miles to go. And the rain was so strong, like it bounces off the, it bounced off the road, it bounced off the table I was sitting at, that kind of rain. Um, and then I, that was a kind of, I felt quite alone then. But I don't think I ever felt lonely. 
I don't I don't think I did. I don't remember feeling lonely. I don't remember wishing there was someone around. I just remember thinking I'm very alone in a very big country. Um, but kind of that's why you do it, I suppose. Have you ever felt lonely? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, I did another big walk. I did uh, the John Muir Trail. And that's a 240 mile walk in the mountains of the Sierra Nevada in California. And I did it because I love John Muir, the conservationist, the environmentalist John Muir, a 19th century guy. I absolutely love his writings. He was a Scottish man, wasn't he? He was. He was born in Scotland in um, 1838. And then he moved to America when he was about 11. So I, because I love him so much, I wanted to go to his land. I wanted, and he loved the Sierra Nevada and he lived there. He lived in the Yosemite for a long time. So I felt I could only get close to him if I actually breathed the same air and saw the same scenery and heard the same things. So I went and walked what's called the John Muir Trail, which is a wilderness trail. And, uh, you know, I don't know about you, David, but I'm just not used to that kind of scenery. We don't have anything like it in Britain, that massive mountains and just so huge and impressive. And uh, you feel very, very tiny when you're walking it. And you're also not used to the sort of the feel and the wildlife and so on. So uh, when I got back, people said, oh, weren't you lonely and frightened? And I said, no. Oh. No, not me. And then I look back at my notes that I wrote. I take quite a lot of notes and I'm writing. And for the first week, all I'd written was, I'm so lonely. <laughs> so, lonely. <laughs> so I really did feel lonely to begin with on that trail. I miss my family a lot. Um, but you kind of just sink into it. And I think that's the same with the Camino, with these big, long trips. It takes quite a lot of adjustment to get out of the way we live every day and all our sort of, and just... Um, and just be, and that's quite hard to get used to. Yeah, I'm not sure if I am that kind of material. Um, I, I, I know I've got a friend, in fact, he was actually a, a guest on In Conservation with a, a while ago, who has published a book, an ID book on birds. He went on the walk, he took, he said he took six weeks and he said yeah. he didn't even bring his binoculars. He just came with his bag yeah. and just walked and used the time to kind of find his head and I found that notion very difficult to understand or to, to, for me to be able to do, like to go somewhere without a pair of binoculars walking through you know, countryside and whatever. I, 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 could, I just couldn't do it. But he said to me that some of his best experiences were with birds. He told me that he saw a Dartford warbler at point blank range and it was like the warbler had accepted him as part of the environment, you know, he felt, and he felt part of the environment, he felt, accepted and he said that that was such an amazing feeling to 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 do this walk and not have any pressures not have any mobile phone i mean he actually went off grid for six weeks um no binoculars no nothing it's just him his bag and his legs walking um and i think he he said he he returned from that walk changed um did you yeah I think I return from all the big walks a bit different. Um, they certainly, I certainly, because of the time I walked it in, because it was right in the middle of COVID and when I walked it, there was no vaccine yet. Uh, there was massive and increasing death rates. It was quite a scary time. It, I mean, I know we all can think back to that time and it was frightening, it was worrying. It felt a bit like the world was just teetering. Uh, there was lots of very bad environmental news as well at the time. Was that, highlight in the book and it really did feel like we were entering some terrible apocalypse um but then the camino teaches you you know there's not much that's new on this planet certainly things like covid and so on but you know people walked caminos in the middle of plagues in the middle of great wars in the middle of great disasters so there's nothing these ancient trails haven't seen before and um and that's very comforting, actually, the, to know that you're walking in the footsteps of literally millions of men and women who have taken all their own problems and angst and global situations and, and walked it before you. So in many ways, you don't feel alone. In fact, it helps when you're facing something like that to know to know that, you know, we're just humans going through turmoil and we've always gone through turmoil and it seems like the turmoil 
just changes with the ages, but it doesn't get less. Yeah. But the, that that sense of being very close to wildlife was a lovely one because um, there was one section, I, 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 if you read it in the book, they're called the Mesita. It's a great big flat, flat plain. In the, do you know it at all? And it's kind of just, it's a plateau and it's flat and it's agricultural and it's very intensely agricultural. So you walk, it takes about a week or so to walk through it and there's nothing. There's just massive fields of nothing. They'd grow a lot of sunflowers there, but they were all dead. So there were fields of dead sunflowers and then nothing. So I didn't hear any birds, I didn't hear anything. And just on one day, there was a little track off down to a copse. Someone had planted a little copse of trees. And I thought, well, I'll just go and sit in there for a bit because I was feeling I needed a break. And as I approached the trees, the sound of music coming out of the trees was astonishing. It was delightful. And it was as though every bird in northern Spain had gone and sat in these trees and started singing because um, they had nowhere else to go because there were no trees on the Mesita. It's just treeless plain. And this little copse was like going into a music box. And then when you came out, the sound faded and you went in. And it, I, I kept walking in and out and I took my phone and I recorded the sound of it thinking, this is amazing that everything is singing in these this little scrap of woodland it's quite an extraordinary experience that sounds amazing i know that you started off your interest in natural in a natural world i suppose in geology from what i can gather from your what you said previously um and obviously you know you discovered the the wildlife as well and you seem uh, to personify pilgrimage the more i get to know you i mean you've written um, a few books, a couple of books, Curly Moon being one which really does sort of, as you said, fall on the back of a, of a, of a pilgrimage. Um, for those who don't know, uh, Mary has been campaigning uh, vociferously and, and very, you know, in a very strong way um, to try and protect the, the Eurasian curly population in the British Isles, which is um, unfortunately declining. And I saw, I met you, Mary, um, a couple of months ago in Lancashire at the um, the Northwest Bird Watching Festival, and uh, you told me some alarming news about the curlew population or the ones that be monitored in in Ireland. Can you uh, can you give yeah. us information again? Just by uh, there's a lady there with an amazing curlew behind her as a, as a screensaver, unless it's a real curlew standing behind you, which would be <laughs> hi. <laughs> Um, yeah, so Southern Ireland, uh, curlews were incredibly common. They were really, really common and widespread. And if you look back in old bird books from uh, Ireland from the 19th century, early 20th century, it said just how many curlews there were. They were they're almost colonial. They were quite packed together. Um, but the destruction of the peat bogs, the intensification of farming, blah, 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 same old stuff, spread of forestry. Um, Populations declined from 20 years ago. There were over 5,000 breeding pairs of curlews in Ireland. And this year, there's fewer than 100, quite a lot fewer than 100. And that's in the whole of Southern Ireland. <laughs> so that's not that's not just in one population. That's the whole of the country. There's a fewer than 100 breeding pairs. And it looks like the figures haven't been published yet. So this is uh, just tentative, but it looks like... Uh, naturally fledged only about four chicks this year they have head started and if people don't know what head starting is it's you get take eggs from the wild raise them in captivity and then protect them until the birds are ready to fledge and then you release them again protecting him in that very dangerous period of egg and chick stage um, they did release 38 head started chicks this year plus four so they you know there are over 40 fledged birds but only very a handful of those were naturally fledged so it shows the pressures they're up against doesn't it yeah it's it's, it's it seems to be the same story repeated over and over again and i often feel that i mean you know i just feel that sometimes are we actually making any headway when it comes to to conservation which then made me think about the actual the actual thing, conservation, I'm not sure what the definition is anymore, because when I first came into all of this and before that, before I became professionally involved, 
my idea of a conservationist was someone who would, you know, fist up saying, no, we need to protect this. And it seemed to be everyone on the same level playing field. But over the years, I've realized that actually it's a very different thing now. People see it in a very different way. I mean, an example would be earlier this year, I went to Malta um, and I was, I'm a member of the British Guild of Travel Writers and I was going to their AGM in Malta and there we were in this impressive hotel and the hoi polloi of the association was saying how wonderful they were in terms of their sustainability efforts and all that sort of stuff and no plastic bottles of water, blah, blah, blah. And I had to pipe up and said, but you are hosting your event in a, on an island that has an appalling record when it comes to hunting. And it was interesting because no one actually realized that, or very few people realized it. And one or two people became very vociferous about it to me and saying, well, you know, you need to say this, and you need to fight this. And I was thinking, well, actually, you know, that's not my style. My style is not, you know, fighting hunters. My style is more talking to kids or maybe trying to kind of influence from another way. So I have this sort of fractured view of what conservation is. What, what, how do you see conservation? I think I agree with you, David. I think conservation is a very broad term now. So it, um, it, it, it ranges from people who go out and, and protect their own little patch, you know, maybe just in their garden or, or a local nature reserve or something, to people who deal with bigger global issues. It can be very uh, split into camps. So a lot of uh, shooters and uh, would say they're conservationists because they they create the habitat, which allows things to you know develop, which they can then shoot. So they say they're conservationists. And the other side, there's people who say, you know, anybody that, that, that shooting is all bad and that conservation is all about just letting nature be as it is and no management at all. You know, there's a whole range of people who call themselves conservationists. So it's not surprising that it's a bit of confusing. And also, as climate change has risen up the agenda in recent years, a lot of people just put uh, recycling their plastic bottles into the term conservation. You know, it's it's general environmental protection. So it's um, I agree, it's it's changed and it's broadened. Um, and it's hard to pinpoint who is a conservationist. Um, for me, anybody who cares and protects and does actually does something, no matter how small or how big, to protect the living world is a conservationist. Um, and that's amateur and professional. So I, I'm struggling to find a definition um, with you as well. But I do think it is a term that we find quite confusing these days. And what's the difference between an environmentalist and a conservationist? What's the difference? Well, an environmentalist is broader, I think. An environmental looks after the environment. I think that's uh, today we think of an environmentalist really as someone who uh, understand, does something about climate change or deforestation or these big issues that affect the whole environment. That's how I think of them. Uh, conservationists tend to be much more focused on species and, and habitat restoration, species restoration. So am I right? That's how I think of it in my head. So environmentalist is bigger and broader and probably much more related to, um, much more related to something like climate change, I imagine. Do you think um, the more militant edges of, conservation, for example, like uh, the campaign against um, bird slaughter or the uh, Just Stop Oil, do you think that what they do is helping the whole sort of movement of conservation? Um, I think I think it takes us all, actually. And I think uh, there's room for all sorts of expression. You are like me. You say you don't like the conflict. You don't want to get involved in the going out and, and shaking your fist at people and holding up placards, nor do I. That's not me either. 
But you do need agitators in society. You do need people who disrupt things and say, hang on a minute, you're just being a bit too complacent here. And um, although I might not like it and I wouldn't do it, I can see the value of it. Um, but I don't think it should all be that. And I think um, so. I think we're in such a serious situation with the way the natural world is in terms of species loss and in the acceleration of climate change. We need all the quivers, uh, the arrows in the quiver to fight it. And if some of them, that's their style and they think they can get the message through by being very disruptive, then, you know, all power to them. But I couldn't do it. Do you think that also affects the general public in terms of how they perceive conservationists? Uh, probably not generally, because not everybody's like that. And, um, you know, there's plenty of us that don't do that. Um, but even if it just makes people stop and think for a minute, that's probably not a bad thing, really. But I, do, I saying that, I understand the distress that's been caused at times. I really do. And, and I couldn't. I couldn't do that. I couldn't be the instigator of that distress. Um, but I do know people have come away and said, oh, well, yeah, OK, well, well, you know, if you feel that strongly, there must be something in it. Oh, I, if there was an easy answer, David, we'd all have it, wouldn't we? But we don't. But yes, probably there is a room for agitators. How far you want to take that is a mute point. Um, but and there's a as a role for peacemakers and education as uh, educationalists as well, which is probably more where you and I sit. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's difficult when you have a government in Britain anyway, who are seemingly totally uninterested, despite having the label of environment secretary or what have you, which I'm glad to say today, by the way, the, the useless person that was um, in, in that post has now been removed and hopefully someone slightly better will be put, will be put in. I'm talking about the environment secretary here. Um, but it's just, I mean, we were talking earlier before we pressed the record button um, and you raised an interesting point, which I never really considered before. And that is the fact that, you know, you've got conservationists, you have uh, naturalists, and then you have natural scientists, which I is a phrase which I've not actually heard of before. Um, and you were basically saying that we need to kind of have some happy medium because um, the naturalist side of the, the spectrum is is actually quite small and, in my opinion, diminishing. Mm. Yeah. So if you imagine a Venn Grand, you've got three circles and they all kind of interlock a bit, but they're still separate. A Venn, the classic Venn diagram. Um, the naturalist is the smallest of those circles, and the naturalist is you know, for so long has been thought of as the geeky anorak, binocular carrying, always with a microscope, you know, looking at things in the field um, and a bit sort of a bit on the outside there. Um, but they know the names of things and they, they know how things interact. They're fascinated by the natural world around them. A, a natural scientist is much more scientific in their approach. They answer big questions about the way the world works. So they want to answer questions about how a species, uh, how it evolved, what it needs, how it interacts, you know, photosynthesis, how it deals with its um, nutrients, whatever. So natural scientist is answering questions like that. Um, and a conservationist looks after things. So they're three different things, but they're interrelated. And what we need is a lot more naturalists who are also conservationists and are also natural scientists. We need people who tie it all together and make it live in the real world. And so where those things intersect, particularly that very sweet spot where all three of those circles intersect, I'd like to call them applied naturalists, if you like. People who can take their understanding of the workings of the natural world and the intricacies of the natural world and apply that to real world decisions in business, in finance, in industry, in in supermarket, in, in agriculture, whatever it is. We need a lot more of those people who take their love and, and passion and understanding the natural world and say, we've got to protect this. We're making fast fashion or we're growing food. How are we going to protect the natural world, whatever that business is? We need those people everywhere. And we don't have enough of them, which is why I'm so passionate about natural history education. Which leads us nicely on to the GCSE that you actually came on last time to talk about, um, because, you know, what you say is totally correct, but it's how we get those people and how we make 
that whole subject much more relevant because you know you mentioned earlier climate change climate you know the climatic changes um uh, are a major thing which i guess some people are looking at not everyone but it seems that natural history the the environmental the uh biological kind of problem we're having at the moment um has been put um on a back burner almost it will look after itself we need to do this first it's, it's, it's how do we get people to take more seriously, it's the age old question, more seriously, the, the idea that if we don't protect the planet and its inhabitants in, you know, in terms of its natural history, then you know, we haven't got a planet for us. So how do we, how do we get people galvanized? In 1968, there was an amazing environmentalist called Baba Diem, um, and he said something which is so true and the, the mantra which kind of has sort of impressed itself on my soul, I think. It's often this saying has often been attributed to other people like David Attenborough, Chris Packen, but it's not wasn't them. It was Baba Diem. And he said, You will only protect what you love, you will only love what you understand, and you'll only understand what you're taught. You'll only protect what you love, you'll only love what you understand, you'll only understand what you're taught. That's the answer, isn't it? We've got to know what we're talking about. I not only know it, we've got to feel it. So I know the name of a robin, but I've got to really care about that robin's existence as well. And I want that robin to still be here for my children and grandchildren. And I really want a world with robins in it. I really do. I don't want robins to disappear. I don't want curlews to disappear. I don't want polar bears to disappear because I really care about them. And I, and I want to know more about them. I want to understand what it is they need to survive. I want to understand the environment they live in, how that environment's impacted by all sorts of different things. I want to do everything I can to make sure that it has what it needs. And you do that if you love something, don't you? You know, if you really care about something, you will find out about it, you will nurture it, you'll make sacrifices for it, you'll put yourself out there, you'll take risks, you'll be courageous for it. We know that, we know that with human love and it's no different for natural world as well. So that's what we need to, we need to fall in love with the earth again and we need to really, really want it to survive because unless people want wild things in their lives, no amount of legislation, no amount of laws, no amount of demonstrating is gonna make a blind bit of difference. People have got to want it and if people want it, we'll have it. So I guess part of, teaching people to to understand that whole scenario and to want and to love starts from an early age. Um, where are we? What's the latest on the, the natural history GCSE? Oh, the saga continues, David. It's like, it's, it's like a, I could write a sort of, you know, Greek saga or a, a Viking saga on this GCSE. It's all full of heroic tales of ups and downs and disappointments and you know being slain and then having to rise again it's full of all that <laughs> and it still hasn't come to an end the odyssey continues um so it took 11 years to get the government to say yes to a gcse in natural history uh, and people keep saying to me well that's too late you need to teach younger kids about natural history yes of course you do um but there's no qualifications to put it into. I wanted to make it a qualification. And young kids, you're pushing against an open door, getting them to, in, to be interested in nature. They just are. Um, but once they get to 11 or so, um, it starts to disappear. And very often people don't find it again until they're at least in their 30s, probably when they're having their own families. So there's this great nature dip between about the age of 11 and 35. And um, and that's when we need to just keep that interest going. So the only way I thought we could do that was by making it part of the education system, by putting it into the schools. Not just so that if you've got people who teach you, if you're lucky enough to come from a family that really cares about nature and takes you out and shows you and teaches you, that's great. But that's very, very sporadic. Everybody, but everybody from whatever background, whatever race, faith, breed, collided, where everybody has access to understanding nature. And I, the only way I can think of doing that is putting it into schools. So that's why I was so keen on the GCSE. So the government said yes last year in April. 
uh, that was the biggest hurdle to get them to say yes. But then there are quite a number of steps it's got to go through before it actually becomes a reality and actually gets taught in schools. And the next step is the sign off of what's called the criteria, the subject criteria. And the subject criteria is the overarching principles of a GCSE. All GCSEs have them. And it's the it, it's the basically what is top level? What's this GCSE about? And um, it's about observation, monitoring, uh, recording the natural world around you, producing data about it, um, interpreting that data and so on. So it's uh, and it's understanding habitat. That's what the Natural History GCSE is about. So that's the top line of it. And those criteria have been written and it just needs the minister, the schools minister to sign it off and say, yes, I'm happy with that. And then it goes to off qual and it goes to public consultation and it, other steps that have to happen. But these criteria have to be signed off. And since the criteria have been written, uh, the government have just been sitting on it. And it's been sitting on Nick Gibbs desk and he's not been signing it on so uh but he left today and is it james cleverly is it come in as no that's is he's, he's, a, he's a new home secretary oh uh, well who's the schools minister then somebody's come in as the schools minister i don't know who it is either no of course james cleverly's the home secretary um yeah so we're waiting to see who the new schools minister is i don't think it's actually been named or i haven't seen it um and hope that they'll do it. I've asked Caroline Lucas, who helped me on the campaign. I said, is this going to help? Get So will this new person come in and just say, yeah, 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 let's get all that out of the way and onwards? Or will it just get shoved in a drawer and, well, they sort other stuff out? She told me today, she said, I have no idea. I can't, I can't call it. I don't know whether it'll help or not. The other person who helped me, a guy called Tim Oates, who's an educationalist, sent me a WhatsApp literally just before... We started speaking, David. He was saying, I think this is good news. I think they'll push it through quickly now. So take your pick. Who do you believe, Caroline Lucas or Tim Oates? Is there, is there a third option, which is to wait until this shower are voted out and then the next lot come in? Um, well, that is an option, but it's just more waiting. And I just want to get on with it. I don't care who signs it off. I don't care who does it. I just want it to happen. And if, it's, if a new schools minister comes in as a sort of fresh horse, and says, yeah, yeah, great, let's do it. God, don't care what he is, just get on with it, you know, and let's get it into schools as soon as possible. And what about the one question I've seen sort of mooted around was that teachers may be afraid of the subject because I've seen it when I'm with kids, you know, that teachers, even parents, are worried because they don't have the answers. They don't yeah, yeah. Big time, big time. And that is a big worry for schools. Uh, the public consultation that uh, when it was the original consultation, when uh, you have to ask people, is this a good idea to have a GCSE in natural history? And that did happen. Um, overwhelming response was, yes, we love it. We want this to happen. But there was always this, but I'm not sure who's going to teach it. Uh, teachers in my school, I know I'd like to teach it. A lot of teachers said, but I don't think I know enough. And there's a lot of lack of confidence you see we've lost two generations of people who really are connected to the natural world just because that's the way society is we've become more urban more virtual more cityfied and um and we've lost a couple of generations of people who feel they have this easy conversation with nature so that's a very real concern and that's something that we're trying to put right in curly action we're trying to set up and uh, a series of nature hubs around the country, which will provide the resources and courses and networking and experts to help schools get whatever help they need to put on the GCSE. But not just schools, businesses as well, because coming fast down the track towards us it are, is legislation that's going to require uh, whatever industry does to report on its biodiversity its nature positive status so firms industry businesses are going to have to say they're nature positive they're going to have to understand biodiversity net gain and they're going to have to come up with nature positive solutions as they're called all of those are going to need these applied naturalists that we talked about earlier people who understand the natural world and understand the impact of a particular uh, business or whatever on the natural world 
So those people, we're going to need lots of them. So we can't be hanging around. We've got to get these people out there and into society so that we merge the economy with protecting the natural world. But are you worried? I mean, I, I am honest. I have to be honest. I'm worried that this group of naturalists is becoming smaller every day. I mean, I, I often look over my shoulder because I've reached an age now where I, you know, I can look over my shoulder at who's behind. And I don't see that many people. Whereas when I was younger, there was a ton of people ahead of me. You know, there was lots of people who knew lots of things. And now it seems as if there's not that many people out there. <clears throat> well, um, possibly that's true. But, you know, we can't give in to that. Uh, you've got to think this could be a solution. That's why I don't I don't care who signs it off. I don't I don't want to wait another minute. I want to get this qualification to schools and I want to start creating this pipeline of excited young people to come out and make a difference in the world in terms of natural history. I really want they're out there. We know that young people are amazing and they can be so passionate. They can really change the world if they want to. And we just need to give them those tools to get on and do it. So I'm sure it's worse than when you and I were young, David, but you know, we're not, all is not lost. And we've got to be glass half full and positive and, and look to the good things that are happening. Look to the positive things that are happening. Samuel Johnson, the writer said, you know, even just a little bit of hope excites courage. And I think that's a very good thing to hold on to. If we hope for a better world, if we can see that the GCSE gives hope, then we'll have a lot more courage to do the right thing. So uh, I think it's a win-win, actually. So let's just get on with it. I love your positivity, Mary. Absolutely infectious, actually. Um, going back to the curlews, I mean, obviously last year, or well, this breeding season has been pretty bad. Do you, uh, what's the kind of plan of action for, for next year? More, more home well, weird stuff? More well, lots of things, projects. lots of things, David. Um, so, uh, yes, we're learning all the time. So since the curlew's gone up the agenda, there's quite a lot more people working on them. And so we're learning a lot more about them. So getting ready for the next breeding season is quite a, you know, is, is, is just, we're just better at it, hopefully. But also, uh, this last year, Curlew Action, we did a couple of field trips. We went to Finland, and then we went to uh, North Netherlands and Northern Germany. And we went to see how people there are working with curlews on the ground to understand how they're tackling, because we're all tackling the same sorts of issues. Are they doing it the same as us, or is it a bit different? And it was really, really interesting talking to people from different countries across Europe, um, their attitude to these issues, how they're thinking it through, how they're working with people, how they're coming up with solutions. And so we're putting on a conference in, no, it is not a conference. It's a workshop in February next year. And it's a weekend and we're bringing together field workers, curly field workers from across Europe and the UK and bring them together for just two days in Norfolk and saying, right guys and girls, girls and guys, you're the ones with all the field experience. You're the ones that face these issues on the ground. Let's let's share our experiences. Let's share our understanding and how to tackle issues. And let's and let's get some real flow of um, flow of expertise going, so that we all get better prepared right across Europe. And that's going to be really exciting. I'm really looking forward to that because there's plenty of people signing up. And there's a real sort of sense of this is quite important that we need. You, curlew is a European bird, Eurasian curlew. So we all have to look after them. We all have a responsibility from the west of Ireland to Russia to look after them. Um, we house a lot of European birds in the winter, uh, you know, uh, and our birds go to France and Spain and so on. We, it's really a lot of our birds, the birds that we see in the winter coast are going back to Finland and Germany and Sweden to breed. We're all interconnected and we need to learn from each other how to look after them. So that's what we're going to be doing in February. But one of the um, one of the sessions that we're going to do is not just on curly with field work. We're going to hold a session for the first time. I think this is unique 
on um, on ecological grief, <clears throat> facing that, facing the reality, the emotional attrition of working on a species which is constantly declining. And I, I think we don't talk about this enough. And that if you get British Wildlife, I've got an article in British Wildlife that's just come out on this. So this, this real pain and sense of despair that people feel when you go out, say on, on curlews, but it could be any other, many other species, you go out and time, time again, the nest you've been watching has been predated or the birds have been killed or whatever it is. And that sense of ecological grief, that sense of of constant loss is hard to deal with. And I think we need to talk about it more. Is, so, that, the same, is that the same as eco-anxiety or is that... I think that's a bit different. Eco-anxiety is worrying about what's going on. So uh, it's like, oh, it's, it's terrible. Eco-anxiety, I think of more of, I'm really worried about climate change. I'm really worried about deforestation. Ecological grief is that sense of what, of losing something that you're really emotionally attached to. So, um, and so I spent enough time with people in the field working on curlews to know that each year, for example, recently in in i think it was gloucestershire 38 nests nine chicks you know not fun not fun to work with and constantly oh that nest failed oh that nest failed oh those chicks were a week from fledging they've been predated you know all the time nine chicks out of 38 nests is not a great tally so we've got to do we've got to face up to the people that do this work in on the field on the ground they suffer as well yeah it's interesting about this um and this, this eco depression i suppose because um i've i've only ever i've had i mean i'm i get depressed i guess all the time when i see things but i remember one time when a pair of skylarks tried to nest on my west london uh patch in an area of grassland which was heavily visited by dog walkers and I, for two weeks, when I discovered they were singing and I, when the male was singing, I couldn't believe it. It's like, oh my God, I can't believe there's a skylark on my patch in West London. And I remember defending them every morning before work. I'd stand there like a guard. I knew roughly where they bred and I don't care who came to me, whatever dog they had, I would be warding off everyone. But then basically when you actually uh, leave, you know, you then look no longer protected. And I remember being there the morning the two of them flew off never to return. And that was really depressing that day, actually, because you do all you can, but at the end of the day, things yeah. happen, don't they? Yeah. And that's repeated year after year after year with people that work on these rapidly declining species, like curlew, like that wing, like, you know, oyster catcher, like golden plover, like you name it. Um, and I went to a a conference in Zult in Germany. It was the International Wader Study Group. And it was like a sort of collection of the bereaved, you know, because <laughs> waders are doing so badly as a group. Ground nesting birds as a group are doing very badly. So, um, but yeah, your experience with the Skylarks is is real and it hurts. And um, and we don't talk about it enough. Yeah. So what's What's next for you, Mary? I mean, your pilgrimage is continuing. It's not stopping here. Um, what are you doing next? Other than obviously making sure that the, <laughs> the GCSC comes to, to light and that the curlews return. Yeah, the curlews return, the GCSC and the education gets going. Um, I, I do quite a lot of writing. I'm writing a little booklet on the wild flowers of Bristol, which are the what everybody thinks of as weeds. And everybody goes and sprays them and digs them up. And so my friend, who's an, a, a, a botanical artist and myself, are doing a little Bristol booklet, getting people to love their love the Bristol wildflowers again. And leave them just for the spring and summer because they're fantastic to look at, but also amazing pollinators for the pollinators, as you know. Um, oh, David, I barely feel I have time to sort of speak, really. It takes up a lot of time. Campaigning is massive. Running a running a charity takes a lot of time. Being chair of the Curly Recovery Partnership takes a lot of time. Writing takes a lot of time. And I also happen to have a family. So, you know, life is very busy, really. But I'll just keep doing what I can for as long as I can. 
and uh, building legacy, I suppose. All of us need to build a legacy, don't we? Who's going to take on what you do, you know, when you think, right, I've had enough now. So I've got my eye on that as well, I think. I mean, what words would you give to anyone listening or watching this now of hope, basically? I mean, I know you've been hopeful all conversation, but is there, is there a phrase, a sentence that can encapsulate, you know, positivity? Yeah, just honestly, if you don't know what to do, if you feel overwhelmed by what's going on on the planet, just please pick something to love and love it. Just really, really love it. Love it with as much love as you've got. You know, go out and protect it like you did. Find out about it. Write about it. Write a poem about it. Hold a coffee morning for it. Write a campaign for it. Write to your MP about it. Talk to your friends about it. Take your kids to show them about it. Just find something to love and love it. And if you put yourself out there, if you if you have that dedication to something, you'll be amazed who comes and stands at your side. You'll be amazed. People are attracted to passion and to, to real connection. They, they're attracted to that. And we all need a lot more of that in our lives. But, you know, being... Um, Putting yourself out there can it can really hurt as well. I mean, you get hurt a lot. You get the world isn't exactly kind all the time, no. and um, but love is hard, isn't it? Love is a hard thing to live with and to to make to keep fresh. And um, we all know that. God, everybody knows that. And it's no different if you if you choose whatever it is on the planet that you're going to give some energy to. It won't be plain sailing. But boy, it has we have to do it. So that's what, and it'll give you hope as well. Yeah, I mean, love is such an important emotion. Um, and as you said so eloquently today, I mean, it's not just love between humans. It's love is everything. You know, it's love. Yeah. It's loving who you are, where you are. You know, everything. And everything. I think we've got a bit blocked, haven't we? I love has yeah. been a bit blocked. Over the last... We don't talk about it enough. We don't. We're afraid. There's a, one of the things about moving away from being naturalist to being much more sort of scientific and conservation and very data driven all the time, is that you know that emotional side of of our connection to nature has become less important. But it's not. It's it's fundamental to why we do what we do, and we should sing about it and celebrate it all the time, and not be afraid. To be emotional i'm i'm emotional you're emotional david no, don't be afraid of it and i think we just need a lot more witnesses to go and stand there and walk on that pilgrimage journey and i think that's why i'm so fascinated by pilgrimage because it's an ongoing thing constantly reveals itself and that's something that came home to me very strongly on the camino probably more than any many other walks that i've done is that you set off and you just think well quite know why I'm doing this what what's this about and uh, anyway you just keep going and you think mm, I suppose it's all right but slowly it kind of opens itself out to you and you get to understand what it's about and I think embarking on any journey is the same and if you embark on a journey to protect the world and it is a journey it will reveal itself to you and it will lay out a path for you but you just have to just keep taking that next step and just don't stop you are so right because although i'll probably never walk a camino my myself i mean my life has been a pilgrimage especially since i decided to kind of dedicate my life to trying to uh, engage with people living in urban areas with with nature and i think you're right you know in the beginning the path was foggy i didn't know where i was going well, I knew I had to go in that direction, but I didn't know what was there. You know, I didn't know what I'd encounter along the way. And as you say, you just keep going, have faith, um, have that love, uh, be enthusiastic, keep going. You know, there's always going to be a positive way through this and you'll, you'll get there. And I think, you know, that's, that's my journey. That's my pilgrimage. And I think I'm very, you know, inspired by people like you, who, despite the knocks, despite the fact you're you're working with species or you know habitats that are being 
batter the whole time, there is still hope. And that's really a positive thing. Mm. Um, last time you were here, I was asking you, where would you be in the world if you could be anywhere? I mean, then I was saying, notwithstanding the current situation, which was, which was COVID, um, you talked about the Orkneys. Um, is that still somewhere that you would be in the drop of a, you know, in a blink of an eye, drop of a hat? Yeah, I think it is really because uh, just, I don't know whether it's just the Orkneys. It, it's somewhere where I can see a vista, somewhere where uh, there's a landscape that which I feel held in, uh, somewhere where it's got mud. I love mud and uh mud and water together all shining and glinting on the sun I, I love that and somewhere where I can sink down and listen to bird song and Orkney sound kind of brings a lot of that together and um so yes probably but oh David put me anywhere where I uh, and I'm I, I'll try and make it work <laughs> well, even I... above a bus station in Bristol will do sometimes <laughs> Well, I've been inspired by you next year in, set, in October. I'm going to spend a week in the Orkneys on an island called Sand Day. Yes. I've never That's been the there. That's the place to go. That's never been the place there. to go. Never been there before. Just going to go and spend a week on my own, you know, and just, 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 just hang out. So that's what I'm doing next October. Perfect. Oh, uh, Sand Day is my favourite island. As well. Oh, is it? So, okay, cool. Yeah, yeah, you hit on the right one. I wouldn't say it was astonishingly beautiful, but it has something that's quite magical. So you'll love it. Well, that will do me. Okay, um, just to let everyone know who's watching um, now and in the future, we've got a few more uh, in conservations coming up. Um, we have a variety of different um, subjects ranging from cryptozoology, which I'm really fascinated by. Uh, through to um, talking about what is the Royal Society for Protection of Birds, um, talking about how, how tour companies are run in the US and painting for conservation, all sorts of stuff between now and the end of July at least. And keep watching, uh, looking at the, um, the website, theunbirdofworld.com, um, to find out what's coming next. Um, what is coming next now will be a Q&A and if you're watching this in the future and you're wondering where is Q&A, you need to join the Urban Bird of World membership community because it's a benefit for all those members who are, you know, watching in conservation where you can actually watch what's coming next to Q&A. But um, with no further ado, um, I'd like to thank you, Mary, for sparing time to have a conversation with me tonight. Um, a conversation which hasn't been easy really because it's quite emotional and sometimes a bit dark and depressing but i think we can all take a lot of hope from this um from someone like you who i think is a legend and a complete um person on a mission um and i wish you every success and i'll be with you standing by your side so thank you very much mary thank you david that's kind thank you and Zoomers, again, thank you for, for, for sparing your time to watch tonight. And anyone else watching, by the way, please like and subscribe and tell all your friends because there's so many different subjects on the YouTube channel, The Urban Bird of World, and you can find in conservation with um, sessions on there. There's loads of them to choose from. So until we meet again, guys, all I have to say at this point, which is a very important thing, and that is keep looking up. <laughs>